Okay, so we are live with episode four of the YBR show, and it's just two of us today. It's a small cast. The other two guys weren't able to show up, so uh, I'm Fugu, and I'm here with Gabe Dean. What's up? So we're going to probably just do a little bit of a shorter episode, it's a 30 to 40 minutes, just because it's the two of us, but um, yeah, this is a, a lot of questions for Gabe on the forums and stuff like that, so excited to do this. Very excited to do this. So I don't know if you want to start off by... Uh, doing a little bit of your story or anything like that but yeah I'll give a quick summary yeah quick summary. um so yeah uh first things first you know I was a normal kid I didn't have any issues that led me to watch porn um and that's one of the big things you'll hear people say that like are criticizing our movement is that you know we're all jacked up guys that you know had real jacked up childhoods and that's why we watch porn and so one of the things that I try and, you know, clarify is that some of us um, weren't jacked up, you know, with issues or maybe we weren't abused. And obviously, yes, that happened, unfortunately, to some of us. But, um, you know, the reality is, you know, half of us had normal childhoods. So that's where I'll start is I just simply had access to porn as a kid. Um, I found a Playboy magazine when I was eight and uh, I began jacking it to pictures then. Um, and things escalated, you know, when I was 10, we got cable TV, so that man, I could, you know, watch softcore porn and try and catch the, uh, try and catch that squiggly image of a boob here and there on the, everybody knows, you, you know, if you're in your enough. 20s, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> if you're in your 20s, you probably at some point watch that squiggly porn <laughs> where, where you're sitting there patiently trying to get the glorious glimpse of a tit in yeah. the top right corner of the screen. <laughs> I know about that. So that's how it started for me. You know, I was 10 years old. And then, you know, I was watching the man show where you had girls in underwear jumping around on trampolines. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, Howard Stern talking about all kinds of sex stuff and anal sex with porn stars. So I'm a little 11 year old soaking all that up. Yeah. And again, I just thought I just thought it was awesome. You know, there wasn't any shame around it. Um, and things took off whenever we got Internet porn. And that was when I was about 12. Um, I'm 26 now, so this was, you know, 15 years ago, back in, you know, 1999, 2000. And so, you know, as soon as we got internet porn, I could come home and watch it for hours until my parents got home. So um, that's what I did. By the time I was out of middle school, I had seen everything there was to see in porn land from, you know, softcore stuff to gang bangs and bestiality and you name it. I was, you know, just a curious kid looking around. Mm -hmm. Um and I became sexually active also in eighth grade. So all through high school, I was, you know, having sex and watching tons of porn. And then going into college was when I first started, you know, really seeing the negative impact that porn had on me, but I wasn't aware of it. You know, the first thing that happened was I lost my, uh, my motivation. So, you know, I, I, I didn't care about getting a good job. So I kind of didn't take school seriously. So I ended up dropping out so I could, you know, jack off to porn and play tons of Call of Duty since that's, you know, exactly what a young man should be doing. Yeah. Um, and, but you know, like that didn't catch my attention. I didn't realize that that had, you know, addiction related brain changes as the cause, you know, I didn't realize I was desensitized. Um, but what caught my attention was when I tried to have sex with a beautiful girl and I couldn't get it up at all. So this was when I was 23. I was, you know, freshly 23 in real good shape. I went to have sex with a beautiful girl and couldn't get it up. And um, I didn't know why. I wasn't drunk, didn't, hadn't drinking any alcohol. I knew I wasn't nervous because, um, you know, I had tons of sexual experience. And I, I knew I wasn't nervous. I was, like, pumped and excited to, you know, have sex with this girl. And couldn't happen. So I turned to Google. <laughs> and I started Googling around, and it, it actually took me a while to find it. For two months, I was searching, and all I could find was performance anxiety. And I was like, okay, I'm not, it's not performance anxiety. Um, but I finally found a thread on MedHelp with you know, 2,000 comments. And, and one of them was from Gary Wilson. And his genius self said to do the porn-induced ED test where you try and masturbate without porn. And so that's what I did. I tried to masturbate without porn, and I hadn't done that since I was like 14 because I always had, I always had access to porn. You know, it, whether it was on like a, a PlayStation Portable, you know, one of the big things my friends would do would we'd, we'd have porn on our like Game Boys, our our PlayStation Portables, and yeah. um, so, so I used that until I got my own laptop. And um, yeah, I I told the story. I was on G Gary's radio show. I told the story about we my friends and I actually watched porn in class. 
on those things. So yeah. we, we, instead of getting the education that we needed, we were playing Madden and watching porn. <laughs> so, so obviously that can create some problems. But yeah. um, so I did the test. You know, I tried to masturbate without porn and I couldn't get it up. I couldn't even, you know, I'm sitting there stroking myself as hard as I could for 10 minutes and had nothing but a lip noodle. And then, you know, the, the test said try not to use porn fantasy. But at this point, after 10 minutes of stroking a limp dick, I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fantasize about porn. So I was thinking of the freakiest crap that I watched on porn, and I still couldn't get an erection. So, you know, it finally hit me. I broke down crying, and that's when I ran back to my room to double check. I turned on porn, and bam, I got a 100% stiffy. And that's when, you know, I realized porn was the problem. So that's when I decided to give up porn. Um, I found yourbrainonporn.com and saw that a reboot was possible. So that's what I did. That's my that's my story in a nutshell. Yeah, and we're gonna have some links to Gear Wilson's radio show. You did a really good summary of your story there too, about the reboot and stuff like that. So if anybody wants to check that out, there's plenty of stuff on your story too. Um, so and then. Oh, another thing we wanted to talk about after your story was we talked about your withdrawals on the last episode. And maybe you just want to clarify that or just talk about your withdrawals in general. Yeah, um, y- y'all were mentioning how my withdrawals were really bad, and they were. Um, when, when guys give up porn that are addicted, usually what you'll see is you know increased anxiety. You'll get really stressed out and anxious. And um, an, important t- an important thing to think about is – you might not have had issues that led you to porn, but if you grow up watching internet porn, that can create issues. So that's what happened to me. You know, I, all through my teenage years, I was just a selfish guy that played video games and watched tons of porn. So I never really developed and matured into a young man. So what happened was, see, what had happened was, <laughs> was when I gave up porn, those things surfaced. My, imma- I guess you could say my immaturity surfaced. Yeah. Um, and again, that, that wasn't there before I watched porn. Porn kind of led to that, you know, uh, inability to mature. So, um, so that's what happened. You know, I, my, my anxiety shot up when I gave up porn. I, I became depressed. Um, and that, that panic attack that I talked about when I was at work was kind of – it's like a 50-50 thing. It was, it was half related to my porn withdrawals and then also, you know, the other half was just – I could not handle being like at a full-time job that was requiring a lot of mental, you know, effort, and um, the combination of the two was going through withdrawal and having all that pressure on me and working ten hours a day, and my dick not working, like all that together bundled up into a cluster bomb of just anxiety, and yeah. so that kind of created that that panic attack. And um, so just to clarify, you know, it was fifty-fifty. Yes, it was neurological and physiological with you know. Um, oh yeah, that was another thing I was going to mention is when you give up porn, our pathways actually get more sensitive and there's little branches that grow called dendrites and the, you know, our porn pathways that actually can increase anxiety. You know, that's kind of the reason like our sensitivity to porn might increase for a little bit and anxiety might increase. So I had that, you know, I had that physiological side to it. And then also, you know, it's depressing when your dick doesn't work, (laughs) you know, so (laughs) So it's just a combination. You know, I hit rock bottom, and I was in a very just sad, sad state in life. So mm-hmm. I know some guys can relate to that. It was just a, a horrible, horrible time period of my life. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely not fun to realize that. Those first three months yeah. are really tough. Yeah, but the, the, the good news is, and where everyone can get hope, is that I, you know, I got through that hell, and I came out, I came out on the other side. Now I have my motivation back. You know, that anxiety is completely gone. I have no anxiety now. Mm-hmm. Um, I still get a little nervous, obviously, whenever I'm doing like a public speaking thing or something like that. But that's natural for anybody. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, there's hope. You know, that there's a quote. I forget who says it, but if you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, learn from that. Like, let that pain make you a better man. Let that pain of the rebooting process, you know, take that time to work on all areas of your life Mm -hmm. and, you know, let it, let it grow you as a man. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think, and that's actually good, though, because we talked about uh, your withdrawals in the last episode. I don't think we got it right at all. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> he, was, yeah, he was freaking right. out at work and throwing stuff. And I was trying to, I, I tried to call into the show. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I was going to call in, but, you know, I didn't have the number. So. Well, we had so many callers, I don't know if we could have got to you. <laughs> yeah, the lines were busy, man. Yeah, really busy. Um, <laughs> And that was a, and that leads to another thing. We have this. Li- I wrote a list of Google documents, and it's like a whole bunch of disjunct things in a row. But uh, the next thing I, and we were talking about this a little bit before the show was part of the addiction. Port addiction is about dopamine, and see, people reference that all the time on the the forums. How dopamine desensitization is a huge component of it. It's a huge component of all addictions, really. But I feel like people underappreciate the fact that when we're going through these withdrawals or when we've been using porn for a long time, we've done like mysterious things to the sexual part of our brain that we don't really know about. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have anything to say on that at all. But Yeah. Well, well definitely for, for the younger guys especially, and uh, Gary Wilson's pointed this out, it, it seems to be more about sensitization. Because when you know when we're teenagers, our brains are more moldable. We have more neurons, more you know synapses, and we wire up to things, to skills and memories deeper than a, you know a, a de- fully developed brain does. Mm-hmm. So so that appears to be why it's taken us longer. Is we have these deep you know hardwired pathways that take a little longer to go away. And so that's one thing to really consider is it's it's more about it's less about the desensitization than it is about just just like Pavlov's dog conditioning, you know? We, we condition ourselves to get turned on by a certain stimulus. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's one of the big things that I try and, you know, tell guys is that it's more, it's more, think about it as, you know, a construction worker laying down new roads. And when you're younger watching internet porn, you're creating highways that take a long time to go away. And you know you gotta you gotta redirect those brain pathways to create new healthy pathways, and it just takes some time. So you gotta be patient. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Um, and then the next thing on the the disjunct list, blue balls. Oh my god, <laughs> painful. It's painful. We I have blue balls with a question mark on this list. So you went <laughs> like over a hundred days without an orgasm, right? Yeah, first things first in my reboot, I went, you know, like 106 days, I think, no orgasm. Um, I did have a few wet dreams. Um, I think I had two or three wet dreams, but I didn't have any intentional O. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, man, blue balls. Uh, there, was, there was definitely some time in there <laughs> where, you know, I had basketballs in my shorts. and <laughs> and uh, Ouch. And it was painful. So, you know, one thing that helped me – was cold showers. And I don't know if there's anything else that'll turn you into a man faster than hopping in an ice cold shower. Yeah. Because um, if you've seen Planet of the Apes, I kind of look something similar when they're going crazy and mad. Because you, you get into the shower and you just start beating your chest and screaming. And yeah, yeah. I, it's just like this whole rush of adrenaline. And um, it I don't know what it does, you know, physiologically with the blood flow and all that, but it definitely helped my pain. And um, so I suggest, you know, if guys are feeling pain, you know, hop in a cold shower. Or if you don't want to take a shower, just rinse some cold water over your uh, your dick and your balls. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, there was a – on that same note, you know, there's times where I'd be with my girlfriend and we'd be cuddling and, you know – or we would go for sex and, you know, she would even try, you know, oral sex and stuff like that for, you know, a long time. And that kind of gave me some pain too in the nuts. And yeah. so what I would do is just hop in the bathroom and instead of taking a full shower, I would just take the faucet and you know rinse my my manhood off with yeah. some with some ice cold water, and it soothes myself. <laughs> a quick rinse, a quick rinse. Yeah, yeah. I Come, comes in handy. Yeah, I went 180 days without having an orgasm, and there were some like extreme. It, it would the pain would radiate radiate up into my lower back almost. And then yeah. I would get really bad blue balls. Yeah. yeah. It co- did it, did it kind of come and go? Like one day it'd be bad and then it would be a couple good days and then come back again? Yeah. And I knew it was blue balls because I would have like a, a huge wet dream one week and then I'd yeah. be like all the pain would be gone. I'm like, oh, thank God. Yeah. Thank it was God. very similar. Very yeah. similar. Not a good feel. But, um, so yeah, I suggest cold showers also, not only blue balls, but they can help with urges too. If you feel an urge yeah. to jack off, or you feel like you're gonna go attack some woman in the street? Just hop in, <laughs> hop in the shower and take a cold shower, and 
I think your mind will get off, you know, pouring for a little bit. Yeah, that's a good idea. I heard they're just really good for you in general, actually. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've read the long list, but I don't remember. But there's tons of benefits. Just Google it. Yep, yeah. So, and with that, we actually got a ton of really good questions for you. So, if you're willing to answer some of these. Yeah. We'll start with the underdogs. He had a huge list of questions. I don't know if you want to pull it up or I can just read it to you. But, um... Well, yeah, I guess let's go through them just so the they can hear what they are. Yeah. And underdog, underdog, I apologize for sharing my story. <laughs> we tried to make it brief. We were so worried about pleasing you. We talked about it at the beginning of the show. Uh, yeah, so we could just start with one. His questions are really good, though. They're, like, very specific on your day-to-day life as a recovered addict. Yeah. So I feel like that's pretty good. Um, do you have them up or do you want me to read them? Yeah, just read them and then I'll answer them. Okay, I got so, I'm looking at them right now. Okay, so his first one is, do you check out girls on the street and what is your reaction if you're in a mall, a supermarket, or a bank and then an absolute gorgeous woman walks by? Yeah, so, so on that... I don't think it's inherently wrong or a bad idea to to look at girls, obviously, especially in real life. I think the way I look at it now, instead of, you know, back in the day, I would look at nothing but tits and ass and I would judge girls by their butts. I would just like, you know, I had a, I, I basically didn't look above the neck hardly ever. I was always looking at their body. Yeah. And, um, you know, during my reboot, I made it a habit to first acknowledge just beauty. Um, so it kind of it kind of went from lusting to to looking and it it wasn't lust it was just acknowledging beauty there's a big difference yep. um there's nothing wrong with seeing a pretty girl walk by and you go man that's a really beautiful girl but there's a problem if you're like oh my gosh that ass i wish i could bang her doggy style that's where <laughs> yeah. you know like if if that's your first thought process um you know that could be <laughs> that could be a sign of a problem and i guess you could say now I I strictly I'm not gonna say I'm perfect. Obviously I have you know I slip up to where I have lustful thoughts here and there, um, and I I do still you know just just you know naturally see women's curves and I guess see them as objects still. Like I'm not perfect, but I try and you know see them as the person they are and not just their body. But um, it has to do with my whole you know mindset change around sex and what sex is. And, you know, growing up, it was strictly all, I was real selfish. It was all about my pleasure and, you know, what, what a girl could give me. And so that's why I objectified girls by butts and boobs. Yeah. And, um, you know, just because I thought, you know, oh, a nice, round, perfect butt. Oh, that would be so nice. You know, there wasn't really any, it wasn't really, you know, personal, I guess. Like, I didn't view women as real people. They were just sex objects. And that changed with my reboot, you know, as I, as I regained my sensitivity and just, you know, realizing that porn, like what it does to guys' perceptions of women, you know, like even if you're watching like female friendly porn or what, what people would call uh, feminist porn, yeah, you, you can't deny the fact that the person on the screen is stripped of their, you know, their character mm-hmm. and all they are is a masturbatory aid. So you're literally using whatever type of, you know, porn you're watching, whatever genre, you're using that genre to get off. And um, so, like that would be the uh, the definition of objectifying. You're they're an object of your pleasure. Yeah. And so once I cut that out, you know, it, it kind of over time led to me seeing sex as you know two people connecting equally and not just one one sided. Um, just kind of random to get off the subject a little bit. And Don John, the movie Don John, I wouldn't recommend it for rebooters because there's a lot of like actual porn clips in it. Yeah. But um. Uh, an interesting thing happens whenever he he goes to have sex with a lady at the end, and he does. He has sex with her, and after she talks to him, she's like, you know, that was really one-sided. And he was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, you were really just concerned with your pleasure, you know? And um, that's at the end of the movie, that was like one of the whole main points is that sex isn't just, you know, just about using somebody, but it's about losing yourself and somebody else. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of, in a, in a sense, that's what happened to me, and... Yes, I still struggle every now and then with, you know, checking out girls, but for the most part, I just acknowledge their beauty and really appreciate it. So, that was a long answer. <laughs> no, no, that's a really good answer. That answers everything else in this question, too. All these other ones where do you check your body parts, what is your thought process, stuff like that. Do you have a physical reaction? Um, I, well, are you talking about when I see just random girls? Yeah, just random girls, or do you sometimes have it? 
Some, well, it's, if if I do get a physical reaction, I, I can quickly think about my girlfriend. Yeah. Um, so I don't like, you know, I don't have a desire to, oh my gosh, I'm going to go talk to this <laughs> girl. Um, because I do think, you know, for me personally, this is just my personal opinion, I'm, I'm all about love now and I don't want... I don't want to, uh, you know, have sex with multiple girls. I just, I feel like a committed relationship, you know, bonding together with even neurologically oxytocin and stuff like that. I just feel like that's the way I want to go for me personally. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so, yeah, I guess you could say there's been instances where I do feel somewhat kind of a, a rush. But um, for the most part, I'm able to redirect that energy. And that was on, another question Underdog asked is what do I do? with my you know that horniness that I have let's say let's say I'm with my girlfriend and I don't have sex what do I do with that horniness that energy yeah um and to be honest I work out I uh the main thing I'll do is go to the gym um and if the gym's not you know if I can't go to the gym at that time I'll go shoot hoops uh play basketball in my backyard um or I'll use that energy believe it or not and just get on the forums and start talking about this stuff yeah. Um, I'll answer a couple posts or I'll get on Reboot Nation and, you know, answer a couple messages or something like that. So I just try and redirect it. I try and try and do something physical like working out. And if I can't do that, I'll try and do some kind of learning or answering guys' questions. Do you ever find yourself, because part of this question was, do you ever find yourself engaging in sexual fantasy or are you pretty good at cutting it off right away? Man, I was uh, my flat line was so long. I had like a six month flat line, right? Yeah. And during that six months, I almost feel like I I trained myself not to fantasize. Yeah. Um. I didn't have any. I didn't have any sex drive. So I mean, it was it was pretty easy not to fantasize. Um. And then when I, you know, part of my withdrawal was I got flashbacks. You know, every now and then. I remember one time I was mowing. Uh, me and my brother had a lawn business at the time. And I was, I remember mowing a yard, it was in downtown Dallas, just some building, and I had like a legit flashback of a porn scene. And like I started breathing heavy, um, I, I tried to close my eyes and like think of something else. And it was really weird, but the flashback was like super intense. And um, I, you know, immediately started trying to think about something else. And I think during my reboot of doing that for, you know, six to nine months, I kind of trained myself to stay away from fantasy. So no, to be honest, I don't struggle with fantasy. Um, and again, not to say that it's a hundred percent that way. There's probably been a few times where you know something will pop up, but for the most part, no, it's not a struggle. Yeah, nice. That's a very good answer. Very thorough. Very thorough. And, and to add to it just a little bit, again, it's it's kind of similar of redirecting that fantasy. Like if something does pop up, let's say I do get a kind of a rush or like a sex, I feel my sex drive or you know something like that, a horniness, you if you will. Mm -hmm. I, I I direct that towards. Uh, my girlfriend, you know, it, it makes me crave spending time with her. It doesn't make me crave watching porn. And that's a, that's something that's real important for guys to hear is that, you know, there does come a time in this recovery where you're not going to be a slave to this addiction. If you can, if you can go through a good, like solid reboot, you know, and, and even if you relapse, if you just keep, you know, keep trying and keep trying, eventually you're going to go on a long streak. Like, you know, even you, Fugu, mm -hmm. you, uh, you're on a good streak now. And I, I really think it's just, you know, it's a process and, Nobody, you know, nobody's perfect. Everyone's going to slip up. Um, if even if it's not watching porn, everyone's going to slip up at least fantasizing here and there. So it's just, you know, it's a long process of training yourself not to use porn as that outlet. And eventually, it's going to be something that you don't desire anymore. And I, I have no desire for porn. Any any sexual urge now or fantasy, I direct it towards a real girl. Yeah, yeah, that's really good advice. And then is, uh, question three is, how do you eliminate the need to have sex with different women? This is kind of the same answer, I would assume, though. Um, yeah, I don't want to go through it all again, but you could just say it's about the mindset. And my personal belief is that, you know, sex works best one man, one woman. Yep. And um, that, you know, obviously you could bring a whole moral argument into it, but that's not even <laughs> what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just bonding. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about neurologically, you know, there's chemicals that are released to bond you to whoever you sleep with. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's just that's just how I think sex works best is in a loving relationship. Yeah, and it's definitely a healthy way for a Buddha to think about stuff, too, because it's so different than what we're what we trained our sexuality to be from when we right, started porn, yeah. right? 
you know. No, I mean, underdog, underdog brings up a real good point. Like our whole childhood and our teenage years, we're seeing thousands and thousands of beautiful girls getting rammed by all these dudes. Yeah. And like that's what, even if we don't really believe, uh, some, like, you know, I, I knew that porn was fake. But um, it still kind of, you know, has an effect on how you view sex. And he, he brings a good point. Like, how do, how do you switch from wanting to sleep with all these beautiful women? And, you know, for some guys that might not ever go away. Some guys maybe don't want that to go away. But um, for me personally, it's just knowing that I want to feel love. And I feel like lust never satisfies you. And, you know, if, if all you're after is just sexual pleasure, just this is just, you know, maybe not even related to what we're talking about. But my personal opinion is that pleasure will not satisfy you. There's just there's got to be love there. Yeah, and um, that's why I try and encourage everyone to you know pursue a relationship. Don't don't trade don't trade your porn addiction for a prostitute addiction or just a sleeping with all these girls addiction. Absolutely. Tr- trade it trade it for something more meaningful that you know you're giving to somebody else what you would want them to give to you, which is really just love. Yeah. So. Yeah, not to sound cliche and lame, but that's just honestly how I look at it. No, I think that's really good advice too. I think it's very good advice. All right, so those are pretty much all the underdogs questions, and those are such good questions too. Um, let's see. So I think there was one from Sound FX that he wanted you to talk about your productivity and drive because you're definitely like one of the biggest figures in uh, uh, this the whole reboot and porn addiction recovery process. I feel like maybe sometimes people like think you have like unlimited productivity and you have an erection for 48 hours straight. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just a normal dude. Just a normal dude that the other, you really got to look at my story as in just long term brain training. You know, it, it, I didn't just wake up one day and I am super cock. (laughs) <laughs> um, it, it took a long time to be recovered. And again, I think that's just from hitting, hitting rock bottom. Yeah. Um, but to answer his question, you know, what are my thoughts on pro- productivity, motivation for self-improvement and all around just getting the most out of everyday life? Um, that again, that would just go back to my whole mindset, my, my, my whole mentality change around what this addiction did to me. Um, you know, once I recovered and could feel, you know, let's just say I could feel the dopamine hits from normal everyday things. Um, I started to appreciate everything more. Um, I could see, you know, I could see the beauty in those girls' faces. I could see the beauty in a a good sunshiny day, you know. Mm -hmm. Again, not to sound lame, but I could just honestly feel appreciation for things that I used to not care about. Um, And as far as self-improvement goes, um, I'm not a big self-help guy. And I know that goes, you know, that's different than a lot of what you'll see on online forums. You know, everyone's trying to read self-help books and stuff. Yeah. But in my opinion, reading a self-help book is by definition not self-help because you're, you're reading someone else's advice. Um, so, I mean, no one ever <laughs> says that. Yeah. No one ever says that. But, I mean, self-help by, by definition <laughs> is you you getting out there and living life. Yeah. So that's what I think is, you know, true self-help is what I would call experience. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think the best thing for guys to do, for rebooters to do, is to whatever they want to do with their life, go do it. Don't don't sit around and necessarily read about it. Obviously, reading about it can help, and I do suggest doing that, but don't spend... Don't spend your whole day reading self-help books. You got to get experience. You know, I could read read about basketball all day long, but if I don't go practice, I'm going to suck. Um, and you can apply that to just about anything. Yeah. You can read about being a good public speaker, but if you don't practice public speaking, you're going to stutter like crazy and sound stupid up there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and if you apply that to the rebooting process, get out there and talk to, you know, potential mates, get out there and talk to real people, you know, mm-hmm. don't, don't sit around reading pickup artist crap, go out there and actually engage in conversation with real people. And I think that. I think that'll rewire you and that'll, you know, increase your confidence faster than sitting around reading stuff all day. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's really good advice. And that's what I did um, during my reboot is I tried to I tried to get out as much as possible and hang out with real friends and spend time with my girlfriend. When you um, did, and then go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to just ask when you started the rebooting process, did you know that 
because you seem like to have made like a holistic life change. Like you're, and maybe I'm yeah. just kind of extrapolating, but you seem like a totally different person than you were before you started rebooting and all that. Did you kind of incrementally realize that you were going to have to change everything about your life? Or? Uh, yeah, I would say there's two big stages. The first stage was my limp dick stage, and that was that was holy crap, my dick's broken. Yeah. So the first stage was I need to get my dick working again. <laughs> um, it, it was yeah. still it was still very selfish. Um, and then about you know three months in when I when I still wasn't cured and I was really depressed and I was just at an all time low. Um, that's when I started realizing, you know, like what I did with my life and I, it got more emotional, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, it got more like, I guess you could say I was, um, evaluating my past choices and I spent like, you know, I had a great childhood. I loved it. I had so much fun, but I spent so much time just sitting and staring at a screen. Yeah. Um, video games were huge. I don't talk about this a lot, but I was a super, you know, into call of duty, to where I was trying to like be a MLG gamer and all that, and yeah. and even before then, like in high school, Halo and Command and Conquer, and I could go on Goldeneye when I was little on N sixty four, the best game ever. Yeah. Oh um, my god. Like you know, like video games consumed my life, and then if I wasn't doing that, I would jack it off to porn, and then you know <clears throat> treat people selfishly too. So I guess you could say just looking back. Looking back on my whole life, when I was that depressed and I, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to recover, I had a limp noodle, I had a girlfriend I was lying to, like all this was just eating away at my soul. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, it hit me and that's when I realized, okay, you know, like <clears throat> pursuit, the pursuit of pleasure never satisfied me. If I were to, if I were to describe to y'all what I did growing up, it would be pursuing pleasure. And um, doing that led me to a place where I couldn't experience pleasure. So that's when I realized yeah. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna pursue love. I'm gonna pursue joy. And then in doing that, that's when you really experience, you know, more pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of us relate to that too. I mean, I, I played so much StarCraft, and I wanted to be an MLG pro in StarCraft too. Yeah, video yeah. games. Video games. I, I wrote a rant on YBR about this a long time ago. It, it, they hijack. They literally hijack our desire as men to yeah. produce and cultivate. Like I, I think every guy has it programmed in them to cr produce and cultivate things. And um, when you're playing video games, like whether it's Call of Duty, you're getting points and leveling up, or you're you know the leader of your clan, or if you're in Grand Theft Auto, you're buying houses and picking up prostitutes, <laughs> and you're you're you know starting a gang and yeah, like all yeah. this stuff. And you could, uh, I mean, on and on I could go, but you're getting those dopamine hits from video games on a screen that you should be doing, you know, by leveling up in real life. You should be. Exactly. No, yeah, yeah. You should be leveling up in real life, you know, like gaining knowledge and understanding and wisdom and, you know, building relationships and not, you know, virtual houses that mean nothing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just, it, just like porn hydrax are arousal for real people, Video games hijack our drive for life. Yeah, definitely. And you, it feels like you can expend an entire day's worth of energy in three hours when you're on it, you know? Yeah. And just to be clear, I'm not hating on video games entirely. I still think they're cool. But my advice to guys that are, you know, big gamers is try and cut back your time and play video games when you're actually with real people, like if your buddies. Yeah. Like don't don't sit in your basement locked up with your you know your Turtle Beach headset playing uh, Xbox all day. Like actually invite your buddies over and yeah. like have face to face gaming or you know like link up, talk so, or something like that. Yeah. And then again, cut back your time because video game addiction is a real deal too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then I, the only question left is from Aussie, who has been on the forums for a long time, and he just kind of wants to talk about his situation, which is kind of a common situation to people who have been trying to quit for a really long time and they just can't find a way to get on. They did maybe one big streak and then they're falling back into kind of a relapse cycle. Yeah. So do you have any advice for somebody that like that? Um, first thing I'll say is try something new. Um, look at, you know, look at everything that you've done and try to do something new, whether that means, you know, installing a filter, um, or maybe just switching up your daily schedule. Um, definitely just switch something up for me during my reboot. I moved my laptop into my living room and there's been studies, you know, there's been a lot of studies that show just if you, like if an addict gives up his drug of use, 
if they change the furniture and move the furniture around in their house, that's been shown to really help like with recovery. Interesting. Um, and it's because, you know, they, they, the theory is that when you see, you know, the same thing that you had when you're addicted, that kind of triggers you. So if you switch everything up, you know, that might, you know, help with your triggers. And um, so definitely do that, like clean your house and move stuff around and maybe move your laptop or let your friend borrow it for, you know, a couple weeks. Um, and then, you know, I, I know Ozzy mentioned he's going back to college. Like, that's great. Like, definitely be as active as you can and do as many, you know, things as you can that are healthy and productive and not just sit around on YBR all day reading thread after thread and getting depressed. Yeah. Like, basically, my advice would be to continue using the forums, but set aside like an hour. Like, set aside an hour where you're on the forums and then the rest of your day do something. Like, you know, I would suggest do something outside or at least with other people. Don't sit around and get addicted to forums and just sit there refreshing and refreshing and refreshing yeah. because that'll that'll keep your mind on this whole situation and just sitting inside and staring at a screen can be real depressing just, you know, regardless <laughs> of an addiction. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think, you know, my advice is to keep on trucking. Keep mm -hmm. on trucking, change things up and, you know, I hope the best for the dude. Yeah, he's a good guy too. Um so yeah, I, those are all the user questions, uh, and I guess I personally just wanted to talk to you a little bit about not about like specific situations, but like the future of porn addiction. Where like where's this going? How do you want to be a part of it? All that sort of stuff. And I think it's interesting too because this is such a maybe a six year old phenomenon, really, if we're looking at it. Um, so where do you think it's gonna go, and how do you want to be a part of that? I guess. Well, I think it's – so far we've seen the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I don't want to be like an alarmist, but if you think about it, if, if this internet porn is in the majority of kids' lives now with smartphones and laptops and all you know tablets, I think we've seen you know, percentage-wise the tip of the iceberg. I think we're going to see more and more you know, young people having dysfunctions. I hope not, but that's probably what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I hope I'm wrong. But as far as you – know, this whole movement goes, you know, in the past, it's always been about morality. It's been about, you know, porn is evil, this and that. But what, what we're coming at it with now is it's neuro neurological. It's not morality. It's neurality like this. Yeah. No matter what your no matter what your faith is, no matter what you believe, this impacts your brain and it's rewiring sexuality and it's causing sexual dysfunctions. And that's that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And um, there's not enough, you know, porn induced ED hasn't been studied, but it will, you know, absence of evidence or yeah, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because it hasn't been studied doesn't mean it's not legit. And there's plenty of, you know, on your brain on porn, you can find a link to like, like 50 experts that have acknowledged that this is a, is a real deal. Yeah. Um, I was on, it's getting a lot of mainstream coverage. I was on that uh, Canadian show. It's a show called 16 by 9 on Global News Network. And they actually had from Boston Med School, um, Harvard, a Harvard urologist. His name's Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler. He was on the show with me. And he said one of his quotes um, you know, was, we don't know how many people this is affecting, but it's not rare and it's a real thing. Yeah. So, you know, like you have big name urologists that are seeing this happen. You know, the Dr. Oz show last year had a psychiatrist and a urologist on there that said they treat porn-induced ED. Um, so that's a mainstream show. Um, I was on Katie Couric in January. It's going to air. It's supposed to air on July 2nd, so that should be coming up. But um, they co Katie Couric covered it on her show. You know, that's a mainstream channel, you know, Channel 8, ABC show. Yeah. So um, the word is getting out there. What I think is going to happen is just a continued battle with research and what I mean by that is I think we're going to see um, kind, of, kind of something real similar to tobacco, what happened to the tobacco industry um, where you had – you even had doctors that were getting paid by the tobacco industry to say that uh, cigarettes were you know, healthy. Yeah. And you know, we've I don't know if y'all have seen it, but there was on NoFap, there was a guy that posted a picture to an actual ad like from the 60s and it it basically said cigarettes are good for your breathing. Like how ironic is that? <laughs> <clears throat> and what's funny is, you know, in my story, my experience, I found that porn was the most sex negative thing. Nothing's more sex negative than your dick not working. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> if you think about it, it's it's kind of funny if if cigarettes were being, you know, 
publicized as healthy for your breathing and th- and then you have the same thing where porn's you know supposedly so healthy for your sex life mm-hmm. um it's very similar and i'm not a conspiracy theorist i think i think these people you know they have their motives to you know make a living and stuff like that i don't think there's like super conspiracies going on but i will think you'll see some you know fight back from the porn industry on just you know trying to say that porn's not harmful yeah absolutely where where do you want to go with it personally you want to keep talking and doing interviews like this or yeah man um yeah i mean through my reboot when i first you know when i was first reading through these forums that's that's kind of why i do this i i was reading all these forums and realizing that no one's talking about this and so you know i just i just had that passion of i'm going to raise awareness because i know that there are little teenagers out there that are suicidal because their dicks aren't working and they have no idea why. And I just saw a real big need for this. And um, yeah, I mean, I plan on raising awareness and talking about this for the rest of my life till I'm six feet under. I want to, I want the whole, (laughs) I want the whole world to know at least that the potential for harm is there. I mean, everyone can make their own choices. I'm not, believe it or not, I'm not for banning porn because I don't know how that would work. And who am I to tell, you know, let's say you have a married couple. How am I going to say a husband can't send his wife a picture of himself? Yeah. You know, like there's so many – and it's so hard to define porn too. Like is it – could cartoon porn be banned? Like, you know, so really I'm just for education, raising awareness, and definitely for protecting children. Um, so that's where I want to go. I want to raise awareness and I want to protect children. So first of all, they're not, you know, exposed to it at a young age. And then second of all, so they can make better informed choices whenever they get to that age. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, was it, you might know, did Canada just do a program where you have to opt in? Or they... They're, they're, I think they're trying to. I don't know. I know the UK, somewhere over in, you know, UK was trying to do that. Yeah. And I think, to be honest, I'm, I think that's the best approach. I think that there I should too, be an yeah. opt-in. As, a, as you're, you know, the, the internet service provider should provide the filter. Yeah. And then you should opt in if you want one in your house. Yeah. And then also some other practical things would be like and I think this is definitely doable where let's say you take your family to go get iPhones from the store and I think you know AT&T or Verizon could be the they they should have to have a filter on there for anyone under 18. It should come equipped on the phone, a good filtering software for anyone under 18. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the big problem that people go, oh, well, no, you know, your brain on porn and other helpful sites will be blocked by that filter. Well, all you would have to do is if you run an organization or a website that's actually just, you know, helpful material, mm-hmm. you could just, you know, get that website unlocked on their filter. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be that challenging. Yeah. And just kind of run it through something like that. Yeah. I think that's a great idea too. I mean, for people who are above eighteen and want to opt in, yes, yeah. we let people smoke cigarettes and you know, get you could do the same thing. Blackout with, drunk if they want. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. I'm not saying we need to ban it. Again, people should have freedom to do what they want, and it, it could get ugly doing that. But there definitely needs to be protection for children. Yep. Um, because there's no way. Like this is the first time in human history a five year old can have unlimited access to gang bangs, rape scenes, bestiality, and like and even just you know watching normal porn. Like a little five year old shouldn't be seeing that and conditioning his brain to that. Absolutely. So like. I think in the future we're going to look back on this period of time and you know call ourselves fools for letting children have unlimited access to the internet. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It really is the wild west of the internet. People are going to look at this and see, you know, it's just yeah. It, it, we're going to learn a lot from it. I feel like it's crazy to think about that because when we were ten or eleven, we were at least me. I was trying to get on HBO on the TV and stuff like that. Yeah. But kids now they get an iPad when they're like six to play games. And there's think about having think about having YouTube when you're six. I know. That's <laughs> like crazy. I'd, be, I'd be watching videos all day long. Yeah. And on that same note, um, about this whole internet movement, you know, that brings up a good point of internet addiction. Yeah. Um part of our whole evidence for porn addiction is the fact that the internet is proving to be addictive. There's been, you know, now we're hitting close to 70 brain scan studies on internet addiction and all show, you know, substance related brain changes. Internet addiction changes your brain. And, you know, a few of those have shown causality where it actually it shows the cause and when they give up the internet or they cut back, those brain changes, you know, go away. 
that's that's wild. like that is solid evidence that this is legit. And um, you combine <laughs> you combine those close to seventy studies on internet addiction that all show evidence of brain changes with the two studies that we have so far on porn users, the one from JAMA Psychiatry that came out a couple weeks ago, and then the Cambridge study last summer, Yeah. Um, both of those showed uh, addiction-related brain changes. Now, they didn't show causality, but it is strong evidence that you have, you know, they reported the guys that watched the most porn had more um, desensitization, so to say, in their reward circuit. Yeah. They had, they had less gray matter. Yeah. And um, also, they, they scanned um, the... The participants in the survey in the in the study, they actually, you know, they made sure they weren't, um, you know, had other addictions such as internet addiction, and they made sure they weren't depressed. So that's pretty that's pretty telling evidence that it it could be that the porn was the cause. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, this whole internet thing, the evidence is stacking up, and I see just more and more studies coming out that are going to show that this is legit. It, and um, it's not even a far stretch at this point either. I mean, if you get no. addicted to the internet, and let's say you were browsing novel videos on porn, and then also having like powerful neurological phenomenons happening when you have an orgasm and looking at this sort of stuff, it yeah. it's almost even more likely that you can get addicted to porn than internet. Yeah, to say to say that porn addiction <laughs> doesn't exist now, if you're up to date with addiction neuroscience, to say that it doesn't exist now, you actually are the one that need to say why. Yeah. Because we have all this evidence, and not only that, the ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, that's a group of you know around 3,000 addiction experts. They changed the definition of addiction um, in 2011 to include behaviors like sex yeah. and, and food addiction because they, they, they don't look at substance anymore. They look at brains. So yeah. you have these people. You have these people that you know. I would call them flat Earth sexologists. They're not addiction experts. <laughs> they're yeah. all, they're relying on you know old school studies, and they're they think that this is a moral issue. They're not up to date on the science, and so they're the ones that need to provide. Why in the world can the internet change your brain, but not porn? Tell riddle me that. Yeah, a lot of these people are. Like, like you said, they do actually have some investment for holding up their philosophy, though, too. A lot of them have written about how behavioral addictions aren't real yeah. know, five to ten years ago, and now what do they do? All their books are, all their books are invalid, and they're, they're going to just go back on everything they've said. I bet they feel trapped in some way. Uh, yeah, they're going to have to uh, – as this becomes more accepted, they're going to have to come out with some kind of public statement. Yeah. And, you know, to be honest, I, I, I would like an apology. <laughs> no, I'm just playing, but I'm just playing, but but honestly though, they're, you know, we're seeing blog posts that right now like to this day are saying, "Oh, there's no such thing as porn addiction and there's no evidence for porn addiction." Yeah. That's just a flat out lie. And so, you know, they're going to have to deal with that themselves. So, I don't know how they sleep at night, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's I, it's only a matter of time. Five, um, 10 years. To, to, to finish off, though, on what I see the future and what I want for the future, that's why I started Reboot Nation is to um, really just to raise awareness. Like everything I'm trying to do is just to get this more accepted in the mainstream and to, to really let guys know, like all the listeners out there right now, like know that if you go public with this, yeah, you might get a few haters. Everyone got haters. Mother Teresa got haters and she spent her whole life feeding children. Um, so you're going to get a couple haters, but for the most part you get, you know, you get people on your side when someone changes their life for the better or wants to change their life for the better people support that. And, um, you know, in my experience, I've told every single person I know in person about this problem, even about my lip dick. So, I mean, and I haven't, you know, I, I, I didn't get any response that, you know, hurt my feelings or, you know, made me ashamed. Yeah. Um, to be honest, when I talked to my boys about it, like, Three of my really good friends, you know, they when I'm telling them what happened to me, their eyes lit up and they confess similar things. You know, I, I got a, a couple friends that had porn induced sexual dysfunctions, and you know, I would have never guessed that whenever you know back in the day, and they wouldn't have guessed it about me either. Yeah. So you never know what sharing your story will do, and um, you know, that's what I love about this show, Fugu, is that it it really humanizes the subject, which is one of your goals, and I love it. Like just. Just I want guys to know that you can talk about this. I mean, we're in a day and age where not watching porn is weird. So talking about porn is not, you know, taboo. Mm -hmm. um, 
so we need to start talking about it. You know, if the world is going to listen, we first have to make a noise, and that's what we're trying to do. Absolutely. And that's what, you know, I could see in the future, my, one of my plans is to do, you know, conferences and, you know, seminars and hopefully get in, you know, I've, I've done a couple speeches at, at public schools. I've, I've spoken at three schools now, two colleges and a middle school. And, um, you know, I, sh I shared my whole story, you know, my whole porn-induced ED story and how I rebooted my brain with, you know, middle school kids. And I had one 13-year-old come up to me, or he, he didn't come up to me, he emailed me that he was hooked on bestiality porn. Um, after I talked, you know, like this kid poured his heart old. out to me. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, I mean, you never know who's struggling with this. And the way I look at it, you know, if I, if I share my story and just, just one person's helped by it, you know, like it's worth it. Anything, any, any embarrassment that I go through, it's worth it to see someone else, you know, be, have something to relate to. Yeah. And, um, you know, even if you just share your story on the journal section like that, that helps so many people. So definitely everyone that, everyone that posts, like I'm, I'm so thankful for, because that's what I owe my reboot to. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for guys posting and talking about this problem, I would have never connected the dots. Absolutely. So, you know, just, just chew on that for a little bit. Know that, know that everything you post and everything you publicly talk about is going to help people out there. So yeah, absolutely. I feel like that's a good way to end. We did way more than we wanted to, but 50 minutes. Yeah, I think it was a good chat, man. I love, I love doing this. I'm, I'm proud of you for starting it and I'm, I think it's going great and I'm thankful for all the listeners. Definitely share the links whenever you get them. Definitely. I actually just want to say, uh, our last episode got 140 downloads last Wednesday from Tokyo, Japan. Nice. Yeah. I, I wonder if, I wonder if that was a mistake or like what that was. I actually do know there's a pretty there's some interesting articles that came out on like uh, sexual dysfunction in Japan. And yeah, was, man. Like one of the studies showed that forty or sixty percent of teenage guys like aren't interested in real sex or something. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah, is, I mean, you have crazy. a whole. There you go. You have a whole country, whole generation of guys that have grown up in front of screens. Yeah. And so the real life. You know, real the real world out there can't stimulate your brain as much as a screen can because it produces unlimited novelty and entertainment. Yeah, so, absolutely. So hopefully they were there for the right reasons. Either that, or maybe they thought our last guest was Jedi Mind Tricks, and that's also yeah. a, a rap group. So I was like, maybe they're just <laughs> rap fans who came to the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe maybe you had a school or something that shared the link or something. Yeah, that would have been awesome. Um, yeah. one thing I want to say though, just to just to finish up, sure. Um, is to anyone out there that's freaking out about this whole process, um, know that there's always hope. That's pretty much what I always want to let you guys know is that there's always hope. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my reboot took a long time. It took a lot of a lot of effort to recover, but it's possible. And one of the most amazing books I've read is The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doidge. And like it, it's full of it's full of stories where people did phenomenal things with their brains. Like this one girl was born with half a brain. And she was able to function normally. So, I mean, like, they thought that was impossible because, oh, wow. you know, they used to think that, you know, if you had half a brain, you would miss, like, half your functions, you know. But what happened was – see, what had happened was – uh, <laughs> Two times. <laughs> two times in one show. Yeah, I know. Um, what happened was her brain actually, you know, the, the part of the brain that she was born with took over the responsibilities of the other side. So if you can have half your brain missing, I think it's safe to say that with, you know, constant effort and a little bit of patience that we can rewire our brain sexuality. And, and not only that, we know that our brains can change our entire lives. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you're feeling down, just keep on trucking and don't lose hope. We've seen guys take over a year. We've seen guys take two weeks. So you never know how long it's going to take. Don't worry about that. Just keep doing what you got to do and know that, you know, as long as you're alive, there's hope. So there's no reason to give up. Just keep trucking. Absolutely. This has been really great. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, no problem. So I think we'll be back next week with uh, another show. Hopefully the whole crew will be here. It's kind of a weird week. I went up camping and then Eight Man was gone. So we'll... Uh, hey, that's good, man. They're out living life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm stuck behind this computer talking to you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was, it was a lot of fun, though. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks for having me, man. I hope it helps some people. Yeah, me too. So I guess we'll sign out and we'll talk to everybody next week. All right, man. Latest. See ya.